It feels like we're all suffering from information overload or data glut. And the good news is there might be an easy solution to that, and that's using our eyes more. So visualizing information so that we can see the patterns and connections that matter, and then designing that information so it makes more sense, or it tells a story, or allows us to focus only on the information that's important. Failing that, visualized information can just look really cool. So let's see. This is the billion dollar ogram. And this image arose out of frustration I had with the reporting of billion dollar amounts in the press. That is, they're meaningless without context. 500 billion for this pipeline, 20 billion for this war. It doesn't make any sense. So the only way to understand it is visually and relatively. So I scraped a load of reported figures from various news outlets and then scaled the boxes according to those amounts. And the colors here represent the motivation behind the money. So purple is uh, fighting, and red is giving money away, and green is profiteering. And what you can see straight away is you start to have a different relationship to the numbers. You can literally see them. But more importantly, you start to see patterns and connections between numbers that would otherwise be scattered across multiple news reports. Let me point out some that I really like. This is OPEC's revenue, this green box here, 780 billion a year. And this little pixel in the corner, $3 billion, that's their climate change fund. Americans, incredibly generous people. Over $300 billion a year donated to charity every year, compared with the amount of foreign aid given by the top 17 industrialized nations at $120 billion. And then, of course, the Iraq war predicted to cost just $60 billion back in 2003. And the mushroom slightly Afghanistan and Iraq mushroom now to $3,000 billion. So, now, it's great, now we have this texture and we can add numbers to it as well. So we can say, well, the new figure comes out, let's see, African debt. How much of this diagram do you think might be taken up by the debt that Africa owes to the West? Let's take a look. So there it is, 227 billion is what Africa owes. And the recent financial crisis, how much of this diagram might that figure take up? What does that cost the world? Let's take a look at that. Douche, which I think is the appropriate sound effect from that much money. <laughs> 11,900 billion. So by visualizing this information, we turned it into a landscape that you can explore with your eyes, a kind of map, really, a sort of information map. And when you're lost in information, an information map is kind of useful. So I want to show you another landscape now. I want you to imagine what a landscape of the world's fears might look like. Let's take a look. This is mountains out of molehills, a timeline <laughs> of global media panic. <laughs> so I'll label this for you in a second. But the height here, I want to point out, is the intensity of certain fears in, as reported in the media. Let me point them out. So this, swine flu, pink. <laughs> Bird flu. SARS, brownish here. Remember that one? The millennium bug. <laughs> Terrible disaster. Uh, these little green Peaks are asteroid collisions. <laughs> and in summer here, killer wasps. <laughs> so these are what our fears look like over time in the media. Um, but what I love, and I'm a journalist, and what I love is finding hidden patterns. I love being a data detective. And it's a very interesting and odd pattern hidden in this data that you can only see when you visualize it. Let me highlight it for you. See this line? This is a landscape for violent video games. As you can see, there's a kind of odd, regular pattern in the data. Twin peaks every year. If we look closer, we see those peaks occur at the same month every year. Why? Well, November, Christmas video games come out, and there may well be an upsurge in concern about their content. But April isn't a particularly uh, massive month for um, video games. Why April? Well, in April 1999 was the Columbine shooting. And since then, that fear has been remembered by the media and echoes through the group mind gradually through the year. You have retrospectives, anniversaries, court cases, even copycat shootings, all pushing that fear into the agenda. And there's another pattern here as well. Can you spot it? See that gap there? There's a gap. 
and it affects all the other stories. Why is there a gap there? You see where it starts? September 2001, when we had something very real to be scared about. So I've been working as a data journalist for about a year, and I keep hearing a phrase all the time, which is this, data is the new oil. Now, data is a kind of ubiquitous resource that we can shape to provide new innovations and new insights. And it's all around us, and it can be mined very easily. And it's not a particularly great metaphor in these times, especially if you live around the Gulf of Mexico. But I would perhaps adapt this metaphor slightly, and I would say that data is the new soil. Because for me, it feels like a fertile, creative medium. You know, over the years, online, we've laid down um, a huge amount of information and data, and we irrigated it with networks and connectivity, and it's been worked and tilled by unpaid workers and governments. And All right, I'm kind of milking the metaphor a little bit, but it's, it's a really fertile medium. And it feels like visualizations, infographics, data visualizations, they feel like flowers blooming from this medium. But if you look at it directly, it's just a load of numbers and disconnected facts. But if you start working with it and playing with it in a certain way, interesting things can appear and, and different patterns can be revealed. Let me show you this. Can you guess what this data set is? What rises twice a year, once in Easter and then two weeks before Christmas, has a mini peak every Monday and then flattens out over the summer? I'll take answers. Chocolate. You might want to get some chocolate in. Any other guesses? Shopping. Uh, yeah, retail therapy might help. Sick leave, yeah, you'll definitely want to take some time off. Shall we see? <laughs> so, uh, information guru Lee Byron and myself, we scraped 10,000 status Facebook updates for the phrase break up and broken up, and this was the pattern we found. People clearing out for spring break. <laughs> Uh, coming out of very bad weekends on the Monday, being single over the summer, and then the lowest day of the year, of course, Christmas Day. Who would do that? <laughs> so there's a titanic amount of data out there now, unprecedented. Uh, but if you ask the right kind of question or you work it in the right kind of way, interesting things can emerge. So um, information is beautiful, data is beautiful. I wonder if I could make my life beautiful. And here's my visual CV. I'm not quite sure I've succeeded. Pretty blocky. Colors aren't that great. But I wanted to convey something to you. Um, you know, I started as a programmer, and then I worked as a writer for many years, about 20 years in print, online, and in advertising. And only recently have I started designing. And uh, I've never been to design school. I've never studied art or anything. I just kind of learned through doing. Uh, and when I started designing, an odd, I discovered an odd thing about myself. I already knew how to design, but it wasn't like I was amazingly brilliant at it, but more like I was sensitive to the, um, the ideas of grids and space and alignment and typography. It's almost like being exposed to all this media over the years had instilled a kind of dormant design literacy in me. Um, and I don't feel like I'm unique. I feel like every day, all of us now are being blasted by information design. It's being poured into our eyes through the web. And we're all visualizers now. And we're all demanding a visual aspect to our information. Um, and there's something almost quite magical about visual information. It, it's, it's effortless. It literally pours it in. And if you're in navigating a dense information jungle, coming across a beautiful graphic or a lovely data visualization, it's a relief. It's like coming across a clearing in the jungle. And I was curious about this. So I, it led me to the work of a Danish physicist called Tor Noritranders. And he converted the bandwidth of the senses into computer terms. So here we go. This is your senses pouring into your senses every second. Your sense of sight is the fastest. It has the same bandwidth as a computer network. Then you have touch, which is about the speed of a USB key. And then you have hearing and smell, which is the throughput of a hard disk. And then you have poor old taste, which is like rarely the throughput of a pocket calculator. And that little square in the corner, 0.7%. That's the amount we're actually aware of. So a lot of your vision is pouring. The bulk of it is visual, and it's pouring in. It's unconscious. And the eye is exquisitely sensitive 
to patterns in variations in color, shape, and pattern. It loves them, it calls them beautiful. It's the language of the eye. And if you combine the language of the eye with the language of the mind, which is about words and numbers and concepts, you start speaking two languages simultaneously, each enhancing the other. So you have the eye, and then you drop in the concepts. And that whole thing, it's two languages both working at the same time. So we can use this new kind of language, if you like, to alter our perspective or change our views. Let me ask you a simple question with a really simple answer. Who has the biggest military budget? It's got to be America, right? Massive. 609 billion in 2008, 607 rather. So massive, in fact, that it can contain all the other military budgets in the world inside itself. Gobble, 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 gobble. Now, you can see Africa's total debt there and the UK budget deficit for reference. So that might well chime with your view that America is um, a sort of warmongering military machine out to overpower the world with its huge industrial and military complex. But is it true that America has the biggest military budget? Because America is an incredibly rich country. In fact, it's so massively rich that it can contain the four other top industrialized nations' economies inside itself. It's so vastly rich. So its military budget is bound to be enormous. So to be fair and to alter our perspective, we have to bring in another data set. That data set is GDP, or what the country's earning. Who has the biggest budget as a proportion of GDP? Let's have a look. That changes the picture considerably. Other countries pop into view that you perhaps weren't considering, and America drops into eighth. Now you can also do this with soldiers. Who has the most soldiers? It's got to be China. Of course, 2.1 million. And again, chiming with your view that China has a militarized regime ready to you know, mobilize its enormous forces. But of course, China has an enormous population. So if we do the same, we see a radically different picture. China drops to 124th. It actually has a tiny army when you take other data into consideration. So absolute figures like the military budget in a connected world kind of don't give you the whole picture. They're not as true as they could be. We need relative figures that are connected to other data so that we can see a fuller picture. And then that can lead to us changing our perspective. As uh, Hans Rosling, the master, my master, said, um, let the data set change your mindset. And if they can do that, maybe it can also change your behavior. Take a look at this one. I'm a bit of a health nut. I love kind of like taking supplements and being fit, but I can never understand what's going on in terms of evidence. There's always conflicting evidence. Should I take vitamin C? Should we take in wheatgrass? So this is a visualization of all the evidence for nutritional supplements. It's, this kind of diagram is called a balloon race. So the higher up the image, the more evidence there is for each supplement. And the bubbles correspond to popularity as regards to Google hits. So you can kind of immediately apprehend the relationship between efficacy and popularity. But you can also, if you grade the evidence, sort of do a worth it line. And so supplements above this line are worth investigating, but only for the conditions listed below. And then supplements below the line are perhaps not worth investigating. Now this image constitutes a huge amount of work. We scraped uh, like 1,000 studies from PubMed, the biomedical database. And we compiled them and graded them all. And it was incredibly frustrating for me because I had a book of 250 uh, visualizations to do for my book. And I spent a month doing this, and I'd only filled two pages. But what it points to is that visualizing information like this is a, is a form of, of knowledge compression. It's a way of squeezing an enormous amount of information and understanding into a small space. And once you've curated that day, and once you've cleaned that day, and once it's there, you can do cool stuff like this. So I converted this into an interactive app. So I can now generate this application online, this visualization online. I can say, yeah, brilliant. So it's, it spawns itself. And then I can say, well, just show me the stuff that affects heart health. So let's filter that out. So heart is filtered out so I can see if I'm curious about that. I think, no, no, I don't want to take any synthetics. I just want to see plants and, and uh, just show me herbs and plants. There we go, all the natural ingredients. Now this app is spawning itself from the data. The data is all stored in a Google Doc and it's literally generating itself from that data. So the data is now alive. This is a living image, and I can update it in a second. New evidence comes out. I just change a row on a spreadsheet. Douche. Again, this the image re recreates itself. So it's cool. It's, it's kind of living. Um, but it kind of can go beyond data, and it can go beyond numbers. And I like to apply information visualization 
to ideas and concepts. This is a visualization of the political spectrum, an attempt for me to try and understand how it works and how the ideas percolate down from government into society and culture, into families, into individuals, into their beliefs, and then back round again in a cycle. What I love about this image is it's, it's made up of concepts that explores our worldviews, and it helps us, it helps me anyway, to see what others think and to see where they're coming from. And it feels just incredibly cool to do that. And what was most exciting for me designing this was that when I was designing this image, I desperately wanted this side, the left side, to be better than the right side, being a kind of journalist, a left-leaning person. But I couldn't because I would have created a lopsided, biased diagram. So in order to really create a full image, I had to honor the perspectives in, on the right-hand side and at the same time kind of uncomfortably recognize how many of those qualities were actually in me, which is very, very annoying and uncomfortable. <laughs> but not too uncomfortable, because there's something unthreatening about seeing a political perspective versus being told or forced to listen to one. It's actually you're capable of holding conflicting viewpoints joyously when you can see them. It's even fun to engage with them, because it's visual. So that's what's exciting for me, seeing how data can change my perspective and change my mind midstream. Beautiful, lovely data. So, just to wrap up, I want to say that it feels to me that design is about solving problems and providing elegant solutions. And information design is about solving information problems. And it feels like we have a lot of information problems in our society at the moment, from the overload and the saturation to the breakdown of trust and reliability and <coughs> runaway skepticism and lack of transparency, or even just interestingness. I mean, I find information just too interesting. It has a magnetic quality that draws me in. So, Visualizing information can give us a very quick solution to those kinds of problems. And even when the information is terrible, the visual can be quite beautiful. And often we can get clarity or the answer to a simple question very quickly, like this one. The recent Icelandic volcano, uh, which was emitting the most CO2? Was it the plains or the volcano? The grounded plains or the volcano? So we can have a look. We look at the data and we see, yep. The volcano emitted 150,000 tons. The grounded plane would have emitted 345,000 if they were in the sky. So essentially, we had our first carbon neutral volcano. <laughs> yeah. And that is beautiful. Thank you.